To kick off today's conference, I'd like to welcome Colm O'Reilly, Chairman of News Brands Ireland and CEO of The Business Post, and Wout van Wyk, Director of News Media Europe, who are here, to both of them, to talk about the future of news publishing in Europe. Now, in a few moments, we're going to dig into some of the issues affecting the Irish and European news publishing industries. But first, we're going to hear from Georgia Kate Schubert, Head of Policy and Government Affairs for News Corps Australia, who spoke to us earlier about how that country has tackled the dominance of tech platforms in the digital advertising market. Georgia Kate, thank you for joining us. There's been quite a lot of international focus on the negotiations with news publishers and Google and Facebook in Australia in recent months. Can you explain to our audience what this new bargaining code means? The news media bargaining code is a legislative, um, a, a legislative measure. It has been put into the Australian Competition and Consumer Act, so it's a, a, comp a, a creature of competition law. And it's designed to... Um, balance the bargaining power imbalance, I guess, so you're going from this to this, um, between digital platforms on one side and the news media businesses on the other. So it's designed to compel the parties to come together to commercially negotiate outcomes. And if that's not possible, then the code, the legislation, um, includes uh, a process for um, mediation, and then eventually arbitration and a deadlock breaking mechanism, which is final offer arbitration. And um, in a relatively short period of time, as we would know it compared to say, um, negotiate arbitrate models, at least that work in Australia, which can take numbers of years and, and possibly that work in, in Ireland as well. And I'm thinking about in telecommunications sort of context there. So it's, um, it, it, it is certainly designed to be uh, a faster process with still due process in there, but it's really aimed at evening up the bargaining power imbalance between the two parties. What were the key ingredients in making all of this happen? I think a key ingredient was that it was looked at through a competition lens. Now, that may well be unique to Australia and may not be able to be done in other countries, but that was an important uh, ingredient, it seems to me. Um, another important ingredient, I think, was that it was an open consultation. It was all the parties had many opportunities to engage with the Commission about this particular issue. Um, the Commission um, is... If you mention the ACCC, the Australian Competition Consumer Commission, in any um, business in Australia, I think it would usually send chills down our spines um, of every business. They are a formidable creature. They're, very, they're forensic and um, they leave no stone unturned. I think that was also an essential ingredient. And I think when it came to um, the other essential ingredient in this is that the ACCC was given, handed the terms of reference from the, for the inquiry from the Government of Australia. So um, it's, uh, the Government of Australia said, you know, you, you will do an inquiry, here are some terms of reference and, and you go off and do, make your inquiries and, and your findings will be due in 18 months. Um, which then means that the government as well, once the ACCC does these inquiries, is that the, it is up to the government to um, undertake another level of consultation on those recommendations. And from there, the government decides what it will do with those recommendations. So it can agree to them, disagree to them, note them, whatever else. So they were probably um, the key ingredient. It seems the Australian government was very supportive of the news publishing industry. Would you say that that played a significant role in achieving progress? So the role of the Australian government was important. It was important from the initiation of the inquiry itself. And it was important um, at the end of the inquiry and in looking what the recommendations were how they, what would be adopted um, and how they would be adopted. Um, I think the other thing is that um, the political environment in Australia um, was very aware that the, the ongoing, not just sustainability, but the um, ability, the, I guess best to say that it was acknowledged um, by the government that it was really important for Australian stories to continue to be told. And when I say stories, I mean news reporting and journalism. So um, everything from 
community journalism and community stories, so hyper-local content all the way through to very national, you know, what you'd see in your national newspapers or um, uh, television news reporting, radio news reporting at a national level. So from the very end, you know, both both ends of the continuum and everything in between in relation to that. And I think that was quite important. And the government um, had had um, seen that as a really important uh, outcome as, as well as all of the other parties as well, which was to say, um, and of course we were on the brink of COVID and those sorts of things and, and the importance of getting information to people in trusted news sources was really important. So I think that they were some of the important elements of the government um, um, su support, I think, for the importance of um, news reporting and journalism within the framework of Australia itself and the importance of being able to continue to have those Australian voices telling Australian stories regardless of where you were in, uh, in Australia. In your view, what does the new bargaining code mean for news publishers? So what this means for news publishers in Australia is that... Um, that news publishers have um, an ability now to actually be able to commercially negotiate outcomes with the digital platforms. And at the moment, those digital platforms are Google and Facebook. Um, and that, um, so this wasn't, I guess the, the code and its outcomes wasn't about setting a price, a unit price for news or an access price or those sorts of things, because it was about, um, you know, bringing that balance into the bargaining power equation. Um, it was about actually finding a way to enable the parties to have commercial negotiations with the back, the very much the backstop is the code. So the, the, the um, arbitration, mediation arbitration processes are very much the backstop. So the hope of, of the government and the regulator, and I know Rod Sims talks about this when he speaks um, at conferences and in public forums, and he's been reported as saying this, is that the code is the backstop. The hope is, that, and the hope is that the parties are now compelled to come together to um, commercially negotiate. Um, importantly, there is a mechanism in the code or in, in that framework that actually allows um, collective bargaining. So for smaller publishers, they are able to um, collectively negotiate with Google and Facebook separately, um, uh, as well as if, if you choose to do so, um, you can actually commercially negotiate just one party to one party. So there's some of the key elements. So that's what it's allowing it to do. It's really about compelling the commercial negotiations rather than being a hard and fast regulatory intervention that is required to be um, taken every time. That's very much the backstop nature of the code itself. Vaud, News Media Europe played a key role in ensuring adoption of the EU Copyright Directive. Can you tell us briefly what that means for news publishers? The, the EU Copyright Directive introduces the press publisher's right, which is basically a recognition of ownership and value uh, of press content online. And this right recognizes the investment made by press publishers into the production of content, and it allows for more control by the publisher uh, over how this content is used and against what conditions. So as such, the right is meant to prevent free riding of the platforms on the back of the press publishers. And for us, this has um, two important implications. Firstly, in terms of remuneration uh, for the reuse of press publishers' content online. And second, <coughs> in terms of control as press, press publishers uh, will have a better handle on how their content is used, by whom and against what conditions. So ultimately the right is meant to ensure that press publishers can continue to invest in high quality journalism, uh, bringing relevant and trustworthy news to uh, audiences at the local, regional, national and international level. And Vout, just if I could follow, what can we learn here in Europe about the Australian experience and what happened there? Well, I think Australia was a very interesting case study as the platforms showed their true colours to the world. First, we saw that the platforms go through great lengths to avoid having to pay for the use of press publishers' content online to enrich their own products and services. Um, second, we've uh, learned that the threat of mandatory arbitration is effective to force platforms to come to the negotiation table and to conclude commercial agreements with publishers. Um, so to uh, avoid binding obligations under the proposed Australian uh, 
uh, code of conduct, both Google and Facebook eventually concluded agreements with a number of news media companies. However, and I think this would be a, a third uh, lesson, um, tech giants are in a position to sort of pick and choose press publishers they want to partner up with, and that's not good because um, it puts a huge amount of power and responsibility with Silicon Valley as it enables them to shape the news media landscape in a way that they see fit, and in my view, um, that's ultimately a race to the bottom. And, and last, in terms of remuneration, when you look at uh, the deals that have been reported uh, in Australia, um, Australian companies, news media companies, secured uh, deals well over 100 million US dollar per year uh, with, with Google. Whereas, for instance, in France, uh, French publishers agreed to Google News Showcase agreements worth 22 million dollars uh, per year. So, Australian publishers received an amount almost five times higher. Uh, for a market that is less than half the size of France. So that leads me to conclude that uh, in anticipation uh, of an arbitrator's decision of what constitutes a fair price, uh, Google came up with sufficient, uh, a, a sufficiently decent remuneration proposal to, to publishers uh, in Australia from the outset. And I think this is an important lesson to take into account for decision makers in, in other markets. Well, how much do you think is fair? I think I saw you suggest the other week that a figure of around two billion might be appropriate for Europe. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, the 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 value of the publishers, right? I mean, obviously, uh, it is very difficult to put a, a price to to publishers' content, um, but uh, we, we do believe that for uh, the uh, the European market, um, which is a significant market, uh, don't forget we're at what, 500 million uh, or so. Uh, consumers, I think that uh, a price uh, that is uh, several billions uh, of euros uh, would be justified indeed. Okay, but just briefly tell us what role Microsoft is now playing here with European publishers. So contrary to Google and Facebook uh, who threatened to walk away from the Australian markets, Microsoft actually embraced the uh, Australian news bargaining code and uh, stated it would be willing to pay publishers for the use of their content. So at the European level, what we did is we teamed up with uh, Microsoft and a number of other uh, European uh, news media uh, associations. Uh, and we did a joint statement that included a call for an Australian style arbitration mechanism to complement uh, copyright law at the European level uh, and to ensure that platforms remunerate press publishers fairly for the use of their content. Now, clearly Microsoft would not promote uh, such a statement uh, if they uh, didn't see a competitive angle to, to all of this. Um, but we worked on the common understanding that fair remuneration for and sustainability of the press sector is what is needed for uh, technology and democracy uh, in Europe and worldwide. Okay, Colm, bringing this back to Ireland, I want to ask you what this means for Irish news publishers and how they're faring. Be before I ask you that, we know that Irish publishers, some of them anyway, have started to open talks with Google um, along these lines. Uh, some of the biggest publishers here, including Media House Ireland. Um, can you tell us any more about that? And then you might tell us how things are going in general for Irish publishers here. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Um, Irish publishers have started what I would describe at this stage as early stage or preliminary discussions with Google uh, in relation to particularly how Google um, News Showcase works. And, you know, if you look at the Irish market um, within the seven publishers that are part of news brands, it's made up of domestic publishers and international publishers. So really at this early stage, what we're, what we're the approach we're taking is that we're engaging with Google very much from a conversation perspective to understand how this might work, because ultimately, as you've, as you've heard from Vout, um, this is about bargaining, and it's about the ability to negotiate and strike a deal. And that's what's most important at the end of the day, is that what we have is a fair deal that reflects the value that Irish publishers bring to the marketplace, and that works for everybody. And if that can be achieved through something that's negotiated with Google, that's fantastic. But if it isn't, then I think what we're going to be looking at is a situation whereby the um, implementation of the EU Directive on Copyright probably um, enhanced with some type of mechanism along the lines of what we've seen in Australia and the bargaining mandatory code. I think that that's where we're going to see the future going fairly quickly. Okay, and 
along the same lines, Colm, we've seen a, a body called the Future of Media Commission set up by the government. It's an independent body. Um, what measures that it is considering do you think might uh, improve the climate here for news publishers? Yeah, that's a great question. The Future Media Commission, I, don't, I think it can't be uh, overstated to say it's got a hugely important role to play over the coming months in really shaping what the landscape looks like for media and for publishers in, in, the, in the future. You know, if you look at where we are, RTE is in a position whereby it gets the license fee. Um, radio is in a position where it gets the news and sound f fund. Publishing is not getting government support in any uh, shape or form, really. And this is, the Future Media Commission has got a really important role to really set out a roadmap and a framework for the future as to how these things are going to be funded. The one thing I would say is hugely important to recognise is that media, be it TV, be it print, be it online, be it radio, they don't operate in isolation. It's an ecosystem. And publishers play a vital role at the start of that ecosystem. I, I listen to the radio, I can't get over how many times I hear what's in the papers today, a review of the papers, a conversation about the papers. And so from a publisher's perspective, recognition of that ecosystem is vitally important. And from a funding perspective, you know, we think that the uh, license fee is outdated, it's outmoded, it's not fit for purpose, and that publishers are at a point now where support is required. If you look at the news brand submissions, there's quite a lot uh, that you're looking for. You want a reduction of VAT to 0%, mm -hmm. review of the Defamation Act, to implement a digital tax subsidies on the for the distribution um, of newspapers, including transposition uh, of the EU Copyright <coughs> Directive as well. Um, which of these measures do you think will realistically be taken seriously by the government? I think there's a range of proposals there, and I think the strength of that range is that it gives options. And options are hugely important in determining what type of policy directions are, are going to be uh, put in place. From a news brand's perspective, probably the two single biggest issues for us is around VAT and reform of defamation. And VAT is, an, is, a, is a really important one for us. Um, very much if you look across Europe, what you will see is that there are different laws and different jurisdictions guiding VAT. In the UK, Norway, Denmark, there is zero VAT on uh, publishers. In Ireland, it's 9%. You go into mainland Europe, France, Germany, Spain, you're looking at anywhere between 2 and 6%. So we think, again, as part of this equality, leveling the playing field, enabling publishers to compete aggressively in the marketplace, we think what's important is VAT is, is reformed. But also defamation, hugely important for our industry. We have probably some of the most draconian defamation laws anywhere across Europe, and it is a real hindrance to publishers. It is fair, we, are, we have a, a duty of care to the public, we have a duty of care to individuals to make sure that we are protecting people's uh, reputations, that we are publishing, what we are publishing is correct, factually correct, but equally we have abuse of that system. To put that in, in context, about 2% of all publishers' costs is going in defending defamation. It's running into the, into the sums of millions per annum. Um, so reforming defamation, bringing it in line with Europe, hugely important for news publishers right now. Colin, we've been talking an awful lot about legislative proposals and things that should happen for the climate for news publishers to improve. But I'm conscious that a lot of our audience are advertisers, are marketers, and what they may want to know is, separate to uh, the legislative ask, how are we evolving our own products to be better for them? I think one of the things that, I, since I've come into the uh, media industry, I think one of the things that I have been astounded by is the level of innovation that I've seen. Um, you know, there's this perception, and it's an outdated perception, I believe, that circulation is what newspapers are about. What we have today are news titles, highly evolved news titles with highly evolved products. It's not just about a daily newspaper, it's about the online experience, podcasting, video, newsletters, and increasingly data, which is where, where the future really holds. So innovation has been key to what we've been trying to achieve. Um, the key, though, to that is how we evolve the economic model because audience is there. We know it's there. We've seen over the last 12 months, particularly with Brexit, Trump, uh, COVID, we've seen people looking for high-quality fact-check journalism. So it's about how we evolve the financial model to, come to, to be able to uh, substantiate that. Um, and for news uh, looking into the future, the key for us is to create new models, new revenues from those, um, those types of products.
Vaud, what would you say about the recognition of quality journalism around Europe? Where does today's discussion uh, leave that topic? Is there a growing recognition or are we just mere content providers? No, I, I, I do think that recognition of the role of news media in democratic society is definitely, definitely increasing. If we look at Brussels, obviously, I sit in Brussels, so, so, so my, my prime focus is, uh, is here. If we, if we look at sort of the European Commission, for instance, we see clear interest in our sector from three European commissioners, Commissioner Festager, Commissioner Breton, uh, and Commissioner Jourova, um, which not only indicates that there's a growing interest in the sector at the highest levels of the European institutions, but I also see it as a growing recognition of the fact that ensuring a free and sustainable media ecosystem in Europe requires various, uh, various policy fields to work hand in hand. So in Brussels, EU uh, decision makers are becoming more and more attentive to the value of news content, both from an economic point of view, as well as sort of uh, the role that it plays in the democratic society. And so we engage uh, with policymakers across the political spectrum, uh, from the very north to the very south of Europe. On top of that, the European Commission launched its media and audiovisual action plan last year, December, and it recently announced uh, it is working on a Media Freedom Act. And also, uh, News Media Europe, uh, we're working very hard uh, with our members um, and EU decision makers to, uh, to address the dominant position of tech giants through regulatory frameworks such as the Digital Markets Act, which is uh, an instrument in the field of antitrust and competition as well as the Digital Services Act, which focuses more on, on internet regulation. So in parallel, uh, we see, and I think this is very positive, that governments at national level are working on different mechanisms to support a free press. We observe that tech giants are being challenged more and more in a number of markets through different policies and market investigations. And I think that this tendency goes hand in hand with this growing recognition of the value of press content. I think our sector was hit hard as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. And so one of the things that we've been doing at News Media Europe is that we monitored how different member states have implemented measures to support the press in light of this crisis. The crisis that once more uh, underlined the importance of a healthy news media ecosystem to ensure that citizens have access to timely, accurate and trustworthy content information. And so what we see is that many member states have come up with, for instance, tax relief measures, support funds, um, and increased investment in, in advertising. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that the Irish government has not been as forthcoming as, forthcoming, uh, as uh, uh, most other governments uh, in Europe to support uh, the sector. Some in other industries vote might say that that's a begging list. Subsidies, tax breaks, shackle the tech companies, what would you say to that? Well, clearly, um, and uh, I think um, uh, it is fair to, 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 to recognize that obviously we're not the, the only sector um, that has uh, gotten itself uh, under humongous pressure uh, with the COVID-19 crisis. But I think the, uh, the growing recognition of the importance of our sector um, in terms of providing citizens with, with with uh, credible, uh, timely uh, quality information, um, particularly in helping us all to sort of overcome this crisis and over, to overcome this economic crisis, but also more, more uh, importantly, uh, to, to overcome this health crisis. Um, I, think, I think that is, that is proven, that is uh, very important. Um, and therefore, um, I hope that policymakers will uh, will will see the need for a well-functioning uh, news media ecosystem, uh, both in Ireland and beyond. Hey, Colin, finally to you, where do you see this industry in a few years' time? Do you think the Future of Media Commission will produce results that will be taken seriously by government? Do you think there's going to be more consolidation in the industry? Do you have hope that we will still have a vibrant uh, media industry in this country in five or ten years' time? As I said earlier, I think the role of the Future Media Commission cannot be underestimated. It's hugely, hugely important. Um, publishing, as I said earlier on, um, is at a stage whereby audience is there, relevance is there, 
but it is taking time for us to be able to transition to a new financial model. But we are approaching a crossroads, and that crossroads is looming in front of us. It's not too late, but it is coming. And um, what I mean by that is that this is now the moment for us to be able to make real change happen. That real change has to take value of public service journalism. It has to take account of the value that um, Irish journalism is, is playing in all elements of society, be it news, holding people to account, politics, business, sports, you name it. Um, so I'm confident that we'll get something from the Future Media Commission. I hope it's going to be a blueprint that is a real 360 blueprint, encompassing of all aspects of media. Um, I would really urge the government to, when the Future Media Commission has presented its report, I would urge the government to take that, what comes out of that and to implement it as quickly as possible. Uh, the defamation law was put in place in 2009. It was due to be re reviewed in 2015, 2016. It's six years late, and we're not quite sure we're actually going to see something by the end of 2021. So when it comes to a track record of, of government implementing key pieces for this industry, there's not a very strong track record. So I would urge the government to take on board the Future Media Commission and to put something in place that really gives all aspects of media, TV, radio, print, and online, gives us a future. Colm O'Reilly, Chairman of News Brands Ireland and Chief Executive of the Business Post, and Vaud van Wyk, Director of News Media Europe. Thank you both very much for joining uh, us today in this discussion. And thank you also to Georgia Kate Schubert, who is News Corps' Head of Policy and Government Affairs in Australia for her earlier contribution.